Okay. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Office Ergonomics for Remote Workers, presented by our sponsor, Hefferman. We're so happy you can join us. My name is Deb Beto, and I will be your moderator today, and we'll be monitoring questions you may have during the session. Before we open up the session, let's review a couple of key items. If you have trouble with your internet connection during the webinar, we recommend leaving the presentation and logging back in. If you have audio difficulties or a telephone line goes dead during the call, hang up and call back again to the same number. If all lines go dead, watch the on-screen chat box for an alternative call-in number. Please feel free to ask questions or provide feedback by using the chat box or questions box during the webinar. If you're using a tablet, you may need to tap on the screen for the options bar to appear, and then you can select the appropriate option. We may not respond immediately, but we will work your questions or feedback into the presentation. If we can't get to your comment or question during the session, we will be online afterwards to respond, or we may follow up in an email if we run completely out of time. You may also email us at moderator at aspenrmg.com for up to 48 hours after the webinar. This will be a one hour presentation. Questions and comments are very much encouraged throughout and the presenters will be answering questions at the end as well. This will be a one hour presentation. Questions and comments again are very much encouraged. And lastly, we have a number of webinars upcoming covering a variety of topics, including those listed at the Heffernan webinar website. In addition, we offer the mandatory preventing harassment training in English three times a year. With that, let's begin today's webinar, Office Ergonomics for Remote Workers. Our presenter today is Steve Thompson, assisted by the wonderful Diane Probert. Steve integrates a holistic approach to workplace safety. For the past 20 years, he has been actively consulting, teaching, and coaching safety, ergonomics, and risk management. He has served in various capacities, including risk manager, safety and health manager, and business development coach and facilitator. He is the co-author of Workplace Safety, a guide for small and mid-sized companies, and is co-author of both safety and ergonomics chapters in Foundation for Optimal Productivity, published by the DMEC, and Tools of the Trade, also published by the DMEC. Earlier in his career, Steve served in the Air Force as a medic and later worked as an emergency room nurse, LVN. In addition to his role at Askin, Aspen Risk Management Group, he is involved with several charitable causes, including the Insurance Industry Charitable Foundation. Welcome, Steve and Diane. Let me uh, change the presenter over to Diane. Steve's um, panel is not up and running yet, Diane, so I'm going to make you the presenter. Okay, and then I think Steve is with us, so um, if he could be unmuted, then Steve could say welcome while I get ready. Um, they, Steve, you need to click on the, you need to insert the pin so that I can unmute you. He's showing as offline. All right. Well, welcome everyone. My name is Diane Probert and I am an ergonomic coach at, um, Ergo Healthy and Aspen, and uh, Steve and I together have been doing this presentation um, and since we all started working from home in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we um, are going to give you some great tips today um, for working at home and also in the office. So just depending on where everyone is. So if you just hold on one second, can you see my screen? I can see your screen. It just needs okay, to be gotcha. in presentation mode and then we're all set. Yeah. All right, sounds good. Okay, so we do like to start off for our presentation by thanking all of our service women and men, and also um, our first responders and their families who have really been helping us um, in this time um, throughout our country and also through this pandemic. So thank you very much for that. 
And um, Steve always likes to say that we can all take a chance um, to save a life. We just never know when that might happen. And the um, the way that we used to be able to do CPR was where you had to breathe into the mouth and then also do the press uh, chest compressions. But now they're saying that you just need to do the chest compressions. And the best way to do it is to think about a song in your head and just do it to the beat. And so Steve's just kind of put some songs here on his presentation, including um, something from the Bee Gees all the way up to some Lady Gaga. So if you just kind of think about the song while you're uh, doing the compressions and that could help you get the timing right versus having to, you know, count or something like that. So we all are always better with the beat. So just kind of think about that. And then again, I am Diane Probert, and Steve Thompson should be joining us shortly. He's having some computer issues today, but um, we do specialize in doing ergonomic evaluations. We do them both on site and remotely, and uh, we just have a passion for trying to help people and get everyone um, working in a better ergonomically sound positioning. Um, so if uh, you want some more information on that, we'll be happy to share that with you after the presentation, or you can follow up with us as well. And so the I first am, thing we're going to do, I think Steve just joined us, by the way. So just so you know. Okay, great, awesome. Hi, Steve. So we Diane, do have. Our... <laughs> I'll let Hi. you just take over, and uh, we do have a polling question to start us off. And thank you, yeah. everybody in the audience, for being patient, and and uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> it all worked out. Let's go to our polling question. So. Our first polling question, tell us a little bit about yourself. What caused you to be in your uh, ergonomic mode today? Are you new, newly working from home within the past six months? Are you an experienced pro working from home longer than six months? Do you have a hybrid situation where you work from home sometimes in a virtual office or a traditional office another time? Or is it something completely different? So go ahead and vote. And um, I would just want to remind you that questions are very much encouraged throughout, and we will be sprinkling the questions along with the polling questions. And if we don't get to your question during the presentation, we'll try to be on afterwards. And I usually like to see that about 75 to 80 percent of the people are voting to make sure that everybody is still participating. So if you haven't voted yet, make sure you do that so that we can move along here. So. Steve and Diane, 21% are newly working from home, 31% are experienced pros, 34% are hybrid, and 14% are other. Wow. Well, thank okay. You. <laughs> and I know we have another polling question, uh, Diane, uh, excuse me, uh, Deb, to learn a little more from our audience. All right, you can let's, play let's that do second it. one. Our second one, how would you rate your ergonomic knowledge? Are you an awesome expert? Are you just kind of average? Maybe could use some improvement? Not much at all, you're just learning about it, or you're not sure. So again, if you have audio difficulties, you may want to um, check the uh, audio controls on your device. Um, you control the audio, we do not. All right, we've got a good number of people voting. Thank you for your participation. So 4% are awesome experts, 24% are average, 38% could use some improvement, 30% say not much at all, early stages, and the rest, 4%, are not sure. Well, thank you very much, and and um, I'm glad to have all the, all of you participating. It's great to have you here today, and thank you, Diane, for starting us off. I know you'll be running our presentation um, on uh, from 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 the Heffernan headquarters there, and I'll be following along. So, t when we talk about um, re working remotely and working virtually, uh, we have to we have to examine some non-traditional ergonomic approaches to, to the way we work, and we will cover traditional today, which is uh, which you can see on the on the uh, left hand part of your uh, screen. Um, but we're also going to be covering the non-traditional. Maybe it's that desk that's in the garage uh, that you're working at right now, and you've got your car in the background, 
or maybe it's uh, from the couch occasionally or the kitchen table. Uh, working from home or hybrid situation is a little bit different, so we want we want to be able to bring uh, that to you today. Um, and as we as we go on to our next slide, uh, you really can see that we'll cover the basics, and we do believe in covering the basics. Um, and and um, we want to welcome you home, and we want to welcome you to the office, of course. We've got a little graphic there. Um, but at the end of the day, there are a couple of important aspects. One is, of course, posture, which is something that we have to focus on on a regular basis. And the second is taking breaks, moving around, fidgeting, things of that nature. Everything else we've probably learned from an ergonomic perspective, you know, how we're supposed to sit, um, uh, how we are supposed to um, close the monitors are. We are going to go through that, of course. But I think that it's helpful for us to, to cover a couple of critical aspects. One is posture and one is taking breaks. All right, well, being comfortable working from the home is something we've seen a lot of. And Diane and I have been on some phone calls and, and doing some assessments remotely where people are very comfortable. And certainly uh, that is a change uh, for, for working at home or working remotely. Um, but it's also important to continue with those routines because routines are, are important also. The other thing that people uh, experience is they're around their little creatures and uh, all of us, all different types of creatures that we can see here in our graphics. Um, and these are pets uh, or otherwise. I don't even know uh, what that bottom creature is. I think that's koala bear, right, Diane? Um, and then, of course, panda bear. <laughs> oh, excuse me, a panda bear. That's a baby panda. Uh, Anybody have one of those? We'll have to ask our audience to see, to put in their chat box what kind of pets that they have. Did they have any different ones that we've shown on the screen? And then if any of you have had a cat or another furry creature that likes to work with you on your work um, table, certainly recognizing that uh, if you leave that keyboard for a moment, inevitably that furry creature is going to walk across that keyboard and send an email out that you hadn't finished or sent one of those emails that you were never going to send to begin with, just sort of expressing yourself, or stop you in the middle of a document. Uh, you can lower the lid of a laptop if you're working strictly on a laptop and everything will stay going and working. You just have to adjust the settings. All right. And then working from home is also brought on some other challenges, and that is um, a children. And many of the people that we've been talking to or working with have had to had this extra additional challenge. We've also included eight tips from working from home um, we want to provide to you, which is a link there. And certainly feel free to, uh, to, to look at that because although it does appear that, that most uh, schools will be returning uh, fairly soon, uh, that may not be in the same fashion that, that we've um, had in the past. We have another polling question, and I'm going to ask you to go ahead and do that one, Deb. All right. And we're getting some comments saying that the, the, the children are worse than the pets. <laughs> okay. So um, what equipment and tools do you use for work? A laptop or computer with an external keyboard and mouse? A laptop only with no external equipment? A smartphone, a tablet, or other? And this should be multiple choice, right? The multiple answers, Deb? Oh, darn it. I, it did not get set up that way. No, I, oh. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Well, I would just pick the one then, if we don't have that programmed in that way, pick the one that you're most commonly used for work. And I know that we've been finding that in a lot of our calls, and uh, Diane, it's probably been around 70, 75% of people use their cell phones in at work. At least, maybe up to 90 on some. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, if, darn if you it. don't I pick wish cell I, phone, I wish I had that's okay. just recognize that. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I think just people can pick the ones that, the one, the one item that they work from a computer, if they work from a computer more, if they work from a laptop or otherwise, that'll be fine. We'll get to, we'll get to it's, it. It's interesting though. You would think that um, most of the people would say the laptop computer with external keyboard and mouse and laptop only, which is the case. It's 61% for the first one and 31% for the next one. 
but 4% mostly use their smartphone, 3% mostly use their tablet, and 2% mostly use other. Mm. Well, we always like to hear those others. So, folks, if you've got something that you that you use and you want to share with us, we always are interested in learning more. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we will cover the traditional uh, PC slash laptop slash environments like that. We'll also cover cell phones and tablets and other devices, which we'll cover in a little bit. We always believe in, in helping on, uh, it helps in our presentations to uh, show some of the things that people do incorrectly that we can learn from and those things that are done correctly. And we'll progress through this presentation in that way. Uh, nearly all of the people in our, in our pictures are those either Aspen staff members um, or they are Heffernan folks or they are family of people on the teams that are presenting today. So in our first photo, it's pretty clear that this might be good for a few seconds. But um, one of our consultants is demonstrating how to quickly check an email. But you can see her feet are not flat on the floor and she, her body's twisted. And she actually had a broken arm at the time of doing this. So she, we, we feel she was a great trooper to come out and help everybody on this. In our next uh, slide, you'll see one of our consultants demonstrating uh, just sort of a makeshift home office. He's using his dining chair and his table. He's using a very hard uh, mouse uh, wrist support. Um, and in the background, you'll see a product. That's not a product placement. We don't have any sponsorships or anything like that. But we do recognize that alcohol may impair working from, working from home. So let's keep that in mind. One of our consultants is sitting at the sort of in a bar stool, sitting at his countertop in the kitchen, sort of a bar kitchen. And in this case, you can see all sorts of challenges. Shoulders are pulled way forward, which uh, then increases the grip strength. Uh, the elbows are not at about 90 degrees, which is what we generally recommend. He also has a watch on, which is putting pressure on those very sensitive uh, tendons and ligaments that when he puts his uh, wrist um, resting it on the edge of the laptop. And so there's a bunch of little challenges here that are problematic, and uh, we'll, we'll talk more about these types of things as we go along. So let's keep moving. Sort of the cliched image of, of someone in, in sort of a semi-thinker mode getting ready to uh, pull up something on, the, on his laptop. Again, lots of things wrong with this in any kind of lengthy period of time other than maybe to spend a few seconds start kicking off your movie that you plan on watching that evening and then sitting back and watching it more traditional here where the person is using a small keyboard tray and they place their mouse on top of their desk we typically recommend that the mouse and keyboard uh, be on the same level same plane and in this case, we wouldn't. We generally don't recommend a, a keyboard tray unless there are real circumstances regarding um, uh, either the desk setup or the way that you're built, um, and a couple of other things in, in here that we'll talk about a little bit later. But you can see the shoulder is pulled way forward, and what's going to happen? What has happened to this person after some period of time is that you develop neck and shoulder pain. And sometimes that place right in the middle of your back, it's sort of at the base of the scapula. You can feel it there. And uh, some folks like this will also develop wrist problems from this kind of positioning. So lots of things are, are a challenge in this, including the armrests. And Diane will talk about those a little bit later. We'll keep that as sort of a teaser. This is kind of... Uh, obvious, which is on a sharp edge of a desk, which you can use a gel pad or a small towel. Um, and we also, the person's also wearing a watch, uh, which is also, again, putting pressure on the tendons, ligaments. And uh, gosh, those finger and hand positions, probably not the best. Here we have uh, the obvious, which uh, he's smoking, which is a vasoconstrictor, which can uh, be problematic. Uh, the National Institutes of Occupational Safety and Health have determined that 
uh, nicotine is a vasoconstrictor. And if you have a pre, let's say you, you have a back, had, had an old back injury or a knee or shoulders or otherwise, by taking, by using nicotine, it may be uh, limit oxygen to those particular areas, uh, thus increasing pain. But there are other issues in this photo, of course. Um, the positioning is okay, although the neck is slightly bent down and the wrists are not in great position. Lots of things not very good, including just the laptop alone being on, on his lap. Uh, some laptops develop uh, a number of, uh, you know, quite a bit of heat. So that could be problematic. And we're going to talk about a few more issues as we go to the next slides. Again, in the kitchen, it's okay. By the way, that is lactose-free milk, so that's safe. Uh, but the other, the other parts of this are problematic is that, you know, just by kind of quickly checking an email, um, maybe okay for a few seconds, but you could see pressure on the left elbow, pressure on the right forearm, uh, just twisted in the wrong way. Not, not a good setup. And Diane, I, don't, I can't remember. Did you have some more comments about this? Well, I have just found in some of the um, evaluations that I've done, if someone's going to stand at a countertop, um, whether it's your kitchen countertop or maybe you have a bar area like we showed earlier, you're just going to, something's going to have to compromise, right? Because if she were to stand up, she might be in pretty good position for her arms, but she's still going to have to flex her neck down. So it just depends on, you know, how tall you are. If you're very... Um, you know, tall, then you might have a better look at the screen, but your arms are going to be bad. So just kind of keep that in mind that these are positions that you don't want to keep for a long time. That's great feedback. Absolutely. All right. Our next, our next um, slide is a little bit better. And uh, this happens to be one of our Aspen consultants who is a child actor and model. Uh, he came out of, I guess you could call it retirement. Uh, and uh, decided to, to do some photos for us, which we're really appreciative of. But you can see some of the things that are positive about this. His shoulders are back. His elbows are in a pretty good position. Uh, he's actually using the, his uh, thighs to support his arms, which is interesting. Um, and the only challenge with these 1965 television trays is that they're a little wobbly. This might be good for a short period of time, maybe an hour or so working. It's not something you'd want to do on a consistent basis, but let's say that you uh, don't have a lot of options at, in your home or your remote environment. Well, this can be one as a supplemental. We've also included a photo. There are many types of newer portable desks. Let's say you live in a tiny house or you live in, in a small uh, one uh, you know, unit um, apartment or house, then you want to be able to have things that you can set up and perhaps tuck away. And the new, quote, coffee tables allow a couple things. One is you could put the laptop on that top shelf, and you could put a keyboard and a mouse on the lower shelf. That way you'd have your, uh, your display elevated slightly, and you'd also be able to have a, an external mouse and keyboard. Here's a traditional sort of table or dining table where she happens to be wearing trifocal, so the actual display is fine for her if she were to look down. She wouldn't be bending her neck, she'd just be lowering her eyes. Now you may need to, depending on uh, if you wear glasses or not, you may need to change the um, display angle, meaning you'd push the top of the display away from you, or you may need to bring it closer. If you push it further away from you, it may limit how much you have to bend your neck down. So it's laptops are not perfect for ergonomics. Uh, there are, they are fraught with a number of challenges. But if you um, are built and you can use a laptop with its, with its screen, sometimes it's, it's even better to be on a couch where you can use a laptop, uh, a tray or, or cookie sheet or a, um, a, a some other device to hold that up. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, and here is one of our consultants showing us a little bit better positioning on the couch. Again, this is not forever. Uh, this might be 
up to eight hours, but there would have to be a number of breaks integrated. And there are problems with this because heat will generate. Now, you can minimize things like EMR, EMF, which is electromagnetic radiation. Uh, some people are concerned about that. And the FCC uh, determines that if you have EMF waves within six inches of your body, you're okay. So six inches and beyond. Most areas of laptops generate their most EMR in the display, which is where the antenna is. So those are generally at the top. So you're generally pretty safe uh, using these, at least according to the FCC and NIOSH. But there's heat that can generate. We actually have had some individuals that Diane has been involved with doing assessments where they've actually received burns to their legs because they've used their laptop on their leg. Uh, certainly you want to use some sort of um, like a cutting board or a laptop tray or some other device to give you some support um, and also to keep that heat away. Here's yours truly uh, demonstrating what that looks like on a, on a, on a couch. I'm using a pillow to get a little bit better positioning. And you can see the display is bent back so that it will, um, I don't have to bend my neck down to actually look at that too much. Um, there are breaks you want to integrate, of course, with this. Uh, you can see that everyone's positioning might be a little bit different on keyboards, but in this case, you can see shoulders are back, elbows are at, at 90 degrees. And yes, you could do this for longer periods of time. If this is a recliner, you might even put up your feet. And that would bring even the monitor a little bit higher for you because um, you'd probably be laying back a little bit. So all good. Um, again, if you want to minimize your EMR and EMF, you can unplug and use without Wi-Fi uh, or Bluetooth. And then, you know, go to your kitchen table or go wherever to download your emails maybe you're switching off every hour or so. Um, speaking of the kitchen table, let's take a look at this particular positioning. Uh, this is a standard kitchen table. Um, and in this case, we're using a riser, a, a keyboard, and a mouse. And using a standard sort of dining chair, and in this case, a pillow for a little bit of extra support. Diane will go into some of this a little bit later on. One of the keyboards that we typically um, will use, some people like to use, is the ones that don't have the number keys on the right-hand side. This allows the mouse, if it's on the right-hand side, to be a little bit closer to the body. Um, it's not necessary per se, but some people prefer that. We also recommend rotating the mouse between the right and the left hand every 30 days. Uh, we certainly have seen in athletes and others that if you do the same things with the right hand day in and day out, and especially using a mouse, which has a lot of micro movements, um, that in time you may experience some problems. It might be 20, 30, 40 years, but why not circumvent that by alternating your mouse between your right and your left hand every 30 days? Now, if you're a graphic designer, that's probably not um, going to, to be able to be used on your left or your non-dominant hand. Here's a little bit better positioning. This sort of shows a traditional setup, and we won't spend much time here because most of you have seen this. This is um, making sure to straight, stretch breaks every hour. Fidgeting has been shown in a number of studies, and that could be just moving your feet or your legs or shaking your arms or whatever every once in a while. It is important to minimizing the potential for sedentary um, related injuries. And how do you put your feet? Are you getting support? Diane likes to talk about being in a squatting position and if you were going to do uh, exercises thinking of squatting down, that's how you want to be in your seat. You want your feet to be able to support you well. You want your, your hips to be um, you know, well supported. Um, I'll let Diane talk about this one uh, in a little bit when we talk about chair setup. And speaking of chair setup, Diane, I'd like to turn it over to you. Oh, thank you, Steve. So yes, as Steve was saying, um, we are going to go through some steps for you to set up your workstation. And the first thing we want to start with is your chair. 
Um, most of us are probably sitting in chairs right now, so I just kind of want you to take a look and feel of your chair and see how the comfort level is. Um, you want to make sure that it's a good sized chair for your body stature. Um, you can see over on the right here that we have knee height, lumbar support, and the depth of the seat. So those are important qualities for ergonomic chair. And I know that some of us are working from home and maybe we don't have an quote unquote office chair, you're using something else. Um, just try to make sure that it's um, the best chair that you can get to use. So the first step in looking at your workstation is to adjust the seat height to the table or the desktop that you're using. Um, you would like to be as close as possible as you can to a 90 degree angle on your um, arms. So I like to think about try to lining up your ears, your shoulders, and your elbow in one line, and then your elbow, your wrist, and your hand out to your fingers in another line. So just kind of think about when you're working at your desktop, um, you know, take a look and be mindful. Are your, are your elbows a lot higher or lower than your wrists? Um, are your shoulders not in line with your elbows, maybe they're way far back as Steve had pointed out earlier in the presentation. So that's the first step to, to think about is the heat, the seat height to make sure that you can get that good 90 degree angle. And then the second one, as Steve said, is I like to talk about the squatting position that you want to have your your legs and your feet supporting you so that if you just think about going into down into a squat and just having someone push a chair right in underneath you. So you want to ensure that your hips and your knees again are in that same 90 degree angle that we talked about. So just always be kind of thinking about the 90 degree angle. You want your thighs to be somewhat parallel to the floor and your knees um, at the same level of your hips so um, that you can have your feet well supported. Some people, if you're a little um, shorter, you or have short legs, you may need to add a foot rest um, or you can even just use some books because if you get your chair up to the correct positioning for your desktop or your table, then your legs and um, feet may not be able to um, get on the floor. And so that's why we suggest that you get um, a foot, foot rest. And then the third step is to adjusting the seat back position. So hopefully you are using some sort of a chair that you can um, adjust the back, but you can see here that not everyone has to have the back that sits on the way in the back of their chair. You can see Steve here, he's sitting up, there's some room there um, between his back and the back of the chair versus the lady who is being completely supported. So it's your comfort level of what you wanna do. And as Steve had said, it's find a fidget and go back and forth. But you just want to make sure that however you are sitting that you have that good posture. So if you're sitting like Steve, it's going to take a little bit more abdo abdominal muscles to hold yourself up in a nice position and you may start to feel yourself slumping a bit and we don't want that. So just be mindful of your posture um, throughout your day. And then the fourth step is to look at your monitor and your screen positioning. So Steve talked a little bit about it with a laptop here. We're gonna focus more on if you're using an external monitor. So when you're looking straight forward, when you're in your nice 90 degree angle and you've got all that set up, you wanna be able to see um, straight ahead about the top third of your screen or where your main work is. So sometimes people have their monitor too low so they have to flex their necks down to look up and this on uh, opposite they may have it too high where you got to tilt your head up so you want to just kind of be in this what we like to call a neutral position where you're very relaxed you're looking straight ahead and you can see the majority of your work there the distance wants to be comfortable for your reading and again, that will also depend on how big your monitor is, right? So the bigger your monitor is, the probably the further away you want to be. So just kind of keep that in mind. And then your keyboard and um, your mouse need to be centered in front of your monitor. If you use more than one monitor, if you're using them equally, then set up in the middle of the two. If you're using one more often and maybe just glancing over to the other one, then set up in the front of the one that you're using um, the most. And then again, it's just step five is again, talking about the awkward neck posture that I just talked about. And one of the things that I see a lot in my 
um, ergonomic evaluations is if people are looking at items that maybe they've taken notes on a Zoom call or something and they need to trans transcribe them into an email or a document, and looking down on your notepad that's on your desktop, you're going to be having to get into an awkward position. And again, we don't want to do that, right? We want to stay in a neutral position. So we recommend that you get some sort of a document holder. So you can see that there's two different variations here. There's one that um, goes on the table, but it tilts it up more. And that would be like if you had a big notebook or book. If you just have some papers, I like the ones that attach right on to the monitor so it would be like right about there and you can see um just kind of have to just move your glance over to the left or the right for that so this is just again just kind of reiterating all the five steps so you'll get this as part of the presentation so that you can just um take a look at that picture and make sure you have all five steps good to go and then you guys did say that 4% um, of you are using smartphones exclusively and 3% tablets. I have a feeling there's a lot more of us on this call that are using um, for sure our smartphones and perhaps tablets as well. So we're gonna do a little section on that just to give you some tips. Um, some things not to do is um, looking down at your phone uh, for a great period of time with your neck flex down. I know none of you on this call have ever been uh, found guilty of walking and looking down like this and falling into a hole like we've seen on the videos. Uh, we just don't want you to go um, become a viral video. So just be sure if you're going to look down for, you know, a few seconds to look at an email or reply to a text, that's fine. But if you're going to do something long term, uh, uh, we wouldn't suggest that you keep this positioning too long. Better would be to hold up the cell phone. So um, you can see in these photographs here, um, it's the less necks flex it down. They're holding it up. And you'll start to feel um, a little bit of a pressure or um, you know, tiredness in your arms when you're doing that. So that will give you a trigger to move. Um, so that's good. And then also, if you're going to be using a tablet, um, you, know, you can put it, prop it up on a desktop they even have um, holders that you can use an external keyboard so if you're going to be doing a lot of typing um, that would be good and also the pop socket i find is really good for um, people especially if you have a smaller hand and you have a really large phone sometimes you can be in that awkward position of holding that can just you know really put some pressure on your um, hands and your wrist so if you have a pop socket then you can just slide it in and you don't have to put open up your the grip of your hand to hold it for a great uh, period of time. And you can also use that to prop up your phone on a desktop or something if you're gonna be looking at a longer video or reading a longer email. And then here's someone holding up a tablet and it's pretty much the same thing. You wanna hold it up more. You can see her, she's in a good positioning um, she's got her elbows um, and her arms close to her body. Again, um, you're going to want to periodically move. Um, movement is really the key um, to health, overall health, and also it, it goes right into ergonomic health as well. Um, you want to take a break. And again, these aren't positions that you want to stay into a long time. If you're going to watch a movie or something, this would not be the positioning that you would want to be in for a long movie. And here's just some more examples. Um, of a better situation. You can see the um, lady on the very bottom right. You can see one example on the left where she's got her head really uh, looking way down at that cell phone. And then on the right, she's now propped it up. Um, and you can see she has so much better positioning. Her neck is um, not flexing down like that. She's standing in a better posture. And she is just going to be able to be so much more comfortable while she does that and have less uh, bad effects going forward. Um, again, these are all temporary positions. If you can, use a headset or the speaker phone so that you don't have to hold the phone up to your ear for any length of time. And if you can do um, it seated, you can see in this gentleman, he's doing a great job of supporting his um, arm on his knee, his hand, and he's holding his cell phone. He's in a pretty good positioning. And so just kind of keep those um, positions in mind. You just want to try to have the best positioning that you can, however you can prop up your cell phone. And they're just going to review the best practices for the phones and the tablets. Just um, think about having a good um, 
comfortable and natural posture when you're using them. If you can, do it seated. Um, limit your time that you're using them. Um, take some short breaks. So if you are going to set up a movie or something like that, have it in a position to where you don't necessarily have to hold it all of the time because that's going to fatigue your arms, your shoulders, um, and your hands. Um, see if you can prop it up. Also, um, some people are taking and streaming their um, tablets and their phones onto their um, television at home. So think about that, too, because that could give you a better um, positioning. And then here's just some best practices for the smartphone. Um, again, you sit, sit comfortably, limit the activities um, where you're going to have to have your necks flexed down. Take the regular breaks as long as you can. Um, don't cradle the phone. And another thing is think about if you're going to do like a lot of scrolling through something, if you're looking, shopping, doing anything like that, going through lists. Um, think about using um, the left hand for a while and then the right hand for a while and just switch back and forth because then that's going to help you from tiring more easily. And then um, on the right, we have a great illustration here that shows the burden of staring at a smartphone. And you can see with the illustration of the head and the neck as it flexes down further and further, you can see that the um, the effective weight on the spine increases substantially as the more and more you tilt down. So if you look at the very top, it's, you know, it's, it's not too bad. It's 12 pounds. You're just kind of comfortable at your head, you know, typical weight. Then as you go all the way down, when you're really looking down at that smartphone or tablet, it can be the equivalent of having an air conditioner on your neck and your back. And I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound too comfortable um, to me. So just kind of keep that in mind. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Steve, who's going to go over some standing work and sit stand situations that we've seen. Thank you very much, Diane. And let's talk about um, a couple of things as it relates to sit stand. And first off, is the uh, is this great graphic uh, painting, uh, which shows something that we should will be familiar with, and we'll come back to talk about it. But it has a lot to do with with sitting and standing and standing work. And let's get right into that. First of all, um, one of the reasons that um, some people like to sit or sit and stand is there is a belief that it may be healthier or otherwise to be uh, sedentary standing versus sedentary sitting. And actually, some of the studies, unfortunately, for standing work, and we've had, <clears throat> excuse me, generations of standing work uh, to study, uh, there are some challenges that can develop, including varicose veins, uh, aneurysms, and other things by sedentary standing for long periods of time. It's why we traditionally recommend getting up every hour, whether you're sitting or standing and moving around. Let's go back to that previous picture again, if we can, Diane. So one of the reasons that there is a bar rail down below is so that the barkeep can keep you longer at the bar. For any of you that have ever been to a bar, maybe just a couple of you on the call, and you've ever bellied up to that bar, you know that when you put your foot up, it relieves the pressure on your lower back and your hips quite a bit. And if you alternate between what you do naturally between your right and your left foot, you notice that instead of maybe standing there for, oh, maybe just 10 minutes, you can stay there for hours. All right, let's go back to our last slide. And the image on the right demonstrates sort of the traditional setup. You could see that everything, you know, from the waist up is pretty much the same as working uh, in a seated position. The things that you need to be conscious of down, down uh, on lower extremities is uh, probably make sure you're wearing shoes, soft shoes, if that's okay. Uh, either a piece of carpet or anti-fatigue mat, but make sure the anti-fatigue mat is not too thick or in a few hours you'll feel like you're standing on sand and there's nothing like uh, if you've ever walked in sand before, the fatigue that develops. And you want to have something to elevate your feet, whether it's, um, you know, a couple of reams of paper or a box or something like that. They even make footrests that have a flat top on them. So let's talk about some sit-stand guidance from Cornell University, which is a leader in ergonomics. Dr. Hedge has done hundreds of studies of ergonomics, and they don't necessarily recommend a sit-stand, uh, um, you know, sort of protocol. 
they recommend sitting and then breaking for an hour and standing and moving. Um, but if you were to have a sit-stand environment, uh, maybe you have a medical condition that requires you to stand more, this is the typical guidelines that they recommend. So in a 30-minute period, you would do 20 minutes of sitting, eight minutes of standing, and two minutes of standing and moving. Now, it's very difficult for a lot of people to, to integrate this kind of activity, meaning that, okay, I'm gonna switch from sitting and standing you know, every 30 minutes to an hour uh, period of time. And this is not you know, very flexible, but if you're going to use sit-stand, it's not one where you sit for hours and then stand for hours. Uh, you're not getting any benefit from sedentary standing uh, than you are from sedentary sitting. So the real goal is if you like to stand, and you want to stand, then you should be breaking every hour with the same thing and stretching and moving and, and enter, entering those protocols. We would be remiss if we did not talk about activities away from work. Um, it's one of the things that gets missed uh, a lot of times in, in ergonomics, and that is um, the ergonomist comes in, they take a look at your workstation, they make these recommendations of what to change, what to move, how to adjust, and then they leave and, and you change some things back. I've done that myself in my early days. But never asking about what happens away from work. And what we find is that the away from work activities can equally impact how we um, you know, might have the effects of ergonomics at work. So we've come to the conclusion, which is very easy for all of us to do, that we're only 24% of our week are we actually at work, we're 76% we're away. And if we were to focus only on the 26%, or excuse me, the 24%, we would, again, be leaving a large gap. So it's important for the things that we've learned today uh, to also apply those to when you're not, quote, at work. Uh, and at work means whether it's virtually or otherwise. All right, we have a polling question for everybody. And um, Deb, if, if this one did not end up a multiple choice, multiple answer, then we'll ask the audience to just pick the one they're most common. But if it did end up being multiple choice, multiple answer, we want all people to check all the ones that they use. Yes, Steve, I'm so sorry. It is not multiple choice, multiple answer. Um, <laughs> well, in that case... You, if the audience wants to add some comments into the questions box during this poll, I'd be happy to um, read out those comments just for more context as well. So, yeah. What position do you work from most of the workday? Are you seated using an office type chair at a desk or table? Are you seated using non office type chair at a desk or table? Are you using a couch, love seat, or recliner? Um, are you standing or is it something different? And again, if, if the, the one that you use most often isn't here, then go ahead and use your questions box and give me some feedback that might be useful for our presenters. And I'd be happy to read some of those responses that come in. And I am oh, okay. very impressed by this audience's willingness to participate and vote because already we've got almost 80% of the people that have voted. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, and Deb, this is a new question that we proposed, and I can't remember if it was a multi-choice. Maybe it makes sense to be just single, but we'll 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 get this adjusted for the next one. So, okay. how did we do? So we have 67% say seated using an office type chair. 19% say seated using a non-office type chair. 5% are using couch, love seat, or other type of recliner. 4% are standing, 5% are other, and we have um, a couple of comments. One, one person's using a treadmill. Um, one person alternates all of these except for standing. They forget to stand. So we've got you know some, some good feedback there. Great to hear. Thank you very much. Uh, that's terrific. Okay. Um, let's also talk now about um, the stuff that happens when we're sedentary. And uh, I think everyone recognizes that there's been uh, a proliferation of, of applications, um, online tools, gaming, etc. And most of that stuff is done from a sedentary position. As Diane mentioned earlier, yes, you could, you could be doing some gaming or texting or whatever while you're walking, but 
uh, like like she said, are you going to end up being the next uh, viral viral video out there? So in this case, it's important to recognize that if we are participating in things like Facebook or Instagram or other types of things uh, where there is seated, you know, sedentary, be sure to integrate those breaks just as we had talked about before and to use the posture that you would use at work. There are some differences um, between people and there are some individual injury factors. The National Institutes of Occupational Safety and Health had done some study year, studies many years ago to determine the factors that could potentially cause musculoskeletal injuries aside from sort of activities that we do or setups that we use or tools that we use. And some of the more sort of relevant ones, as you can see here, um, cigarette smoking. Some studies have found that smoking um, related to pain in the extremities, including the neck and back. Uh, strength. Uh, those people who demonstrate a greater level of strength tend to have fewer musculoskeletal injuries than those that maybe have less. Uh, even just anthropometry, which is height, weight, body mass index, even those differences have shown uh, uh, that that there can be differences in musculoskeletal injuries. And then physical activity, whether it's too much on one particular joint or body part or too less entirely, can also increase susceptibility to injury. And we've just demonstrated an arm on the right there. Sorry, Diana went too quickly. Um, the arm on the right-hand side of your uh, slide is a typical male arm. And the arm on the left of that is typical female arm. And we don't know why there are differences in the human body. Uh, this is not everybody. This is, a, this is just sort of 80% of the population. You may or may not have an arm. So if you were to put your arm straight out at your side, palm forward, you'd know whether or not you have it straight or otherwise. And again, it's not everybody is the exact same way, but there are some tendencies there. Okay, thank you, Diane. We also want to talk about the things that are non-ergonomic because if you're working from home, uh, there's a lot of things to take into consideration. You may have more things plugged in if you have kids or a significant other um, or others, uh, if roommates or otherwise staying at home and working, you're all plugged in at the same time. Well, you may want to make sure that you've got a, uh, you know, your, fire, your smoke alarm has been checked and that if you have a fire extinguisher, maybe it's time to get one, keep one in your house. But you want to keep things like clothes and flammables, trash, paper, and that stuff away from your cords, and make sure that you don't have things that can cause uh, trip and fall hazards, because that's something that can come up also, uh, which is not typically you'd find in an office setting. We would like everyone to practice what we would consider becoming an ergo champ, and we put together a small acronym filled guideline here. Uh, if I can have everyone's attention for a moment and go down to the H in champ, and for those of you that are on the call, uh, if you'll just rest your arms down at your side for 10 seconds, just let them hang down by your side, just 10 seconds, that's all we're asking. So take 10 seconds just to hang your arms down at your side. Now that alone will bring some of that tension down, help those muscles relax. You can bring them back up now. Um, we generally recommend doing that 60 seconds every hour. So if you're going to take a, a short break every hour and just stand and move around and fidget, then to let those arms hang down for 60 seconds does an awful lot. And uh, let's talk about your journey. Uh, although we're at the end of our presentation, this is the beginning of your journey for for uh, for more, creating more ergonomic health in your life. And we covered all of these particular subjects, including uh, your position of function, uh, posture, uh, making sure to stay well hydrated, um, and of course, alternate your mouse between the right and left hand. Taking breaks, critical aspects of, of staying healthy. And we have some question that we'd like to ask you, and one of our 
final questions. Deb, can you put this polling question out? This one we just keep to ourselves. Um, we'd like to know how we did today. Okay, so we have a couple of questions that we didn't do, Steve. Good. Um, we'll get to that in a moment. We'll okay. get to that in a moment where we ask Excellent. for people to share one thing with us they take away. So let's do this one first and then we'll, we'll All move right. on. How did we do today? So we um, appreciate your feedback here. And again, I'm not going to share your responses, um, but we do have a couple of questions that came in. Are there any benefits of using under desk exercises? Oh, yes, we've seen some of these before. Some some are like um, like a little bicycle wheel where people can um, can pedal. Uh, some are foot presses where they can press and and, and you know go back and forth. Um, there have been shown no benefits really to that because well, well let's take that let's take that let me take that back for a moment. That depends on your circumstances. Now, if you are a wheelchair bound and you have integrated um, for whatever reason, but you still have, um, you know, movement in your legs or otherwise, there may be some advantages to if you have sit down work. But for um, most of us, uh, it the, the real benefit doesn't come in from doing things while the seated position, the benefit would become standing and moving around. But there's nothing that's that's similar to fidgeting. So if you're moving your feet, uh, you're stretching them, you're stretching out your legs, you're moving them back and forth, you're uh, rotating your ankles around. We consider all that sort of fidgeting. So it's a good thing. Okay. And do you have a list of recommended desks that don't occupy a lot of space for working from home? You know, uh, Diane and I have looked at desks over the years, and we typically recommend things from big box retailers. And we actually have discovered a couple of uh, portable tables that are relatively small. I think the key part for everyone to remember is to try to understand what your setup will be. If you're going to be using a, an external monitor, let's say it is 21 inches or bigger, then you have to remember how close can I actually be to that desk? And we see this a lot, Diane, where the desk ends up being a little bit too narrow uh, so that uh, they're not they're not able to stay sort of an arm's length or greater away from that from that from that monitor. Now, with the bigger monitors, it might even you may even be a little further than arm's length away, because in the old days, we'd say, well, if you're an arm's length away from your monitor, you're OK. So you sort of have to gauge this by how deep the desk will be. And in traditional setups, you're looking at uh, perhaps having about 30 inches in depth, but you can go shorter, for instance, if you were just using a small monitor. So it's, it's something that we can't say the exact inches because uh, it might depend on the type of setup that you're using. If it's just a laptop, of course, you don't need much depth at all. If you're using an external monitor, then it has to be at least arm length or greater, uh, depending on the size of the monitor. So that might be one way to judge it. Okay. And um, last question, real quick. Um, how about the the filtrate air filtration system at home or work? Is that an ergonomic consideration? In the United Kingdom and Europe, uh, lighting and um, ventilation are two issues as part of ergonomics. It is not part of ergonomics in the United States per se. Um, so the only thing that we typically have as far as a recommendation is heat, because sometimes people are accustomed to working in colder or hotter environments, and that issue can make a difference on productivity, comfort, and other aspects. So we're more concerned with temperature, uh, that it's not too cold um, for the most part, and that there is a level of, of of heat. As far as filtering air, we don't consider that part of ergonomics in the US. Okay, and we have a couple more questions. Do you wanna continue on with the presentation yeah. later? Okay. Well, our presentation is done. We like people to either ask questions or they can submit one thing that they took away from today's session. Okay, so while you're thinking of the one thing that you wanna submit, to us that you took away from today's session, that would be great. And I will read the other 
couple of questions that came in. Um, if I use a treadmill, what speed should I use and how much time? Oh, wow. Well, the studies that we've seen on treadmills, um, the, the big issue is, you know, do you, do you have proper balance? Do you, are you able to do the work, uh, concentrate on the work? So from a speed perspective, you really have to be, it's going to be individualized to, do you have the ability to concentrate on the work that you're doing and you won't end up injuring yourself? Unfortunately, we've had a number of, uh, we, we've worked with insurance companies before and had a number of people get injured using treadmill while trying to do work. So if I were, if I were to be using a treadmill, which we don't recommend, but if you were, I would have it set at a very slow setting. That could be at one mile an hour or less because you really don't want to be thinking about walking a pace of two miles, two and a half miles an hour, where your real concentration is in the steps versus the work that you're trying to do. And any mishap is going to result in a, in a problem. So I, I'm not going to say any particular speed, um, but it's just to be at a comfort level where you can actually uh, do this. And again, if it were me, I'd be generally less than a mile per hour. If your treadmill can go less than that, um, it's really going to be up to you, though. Okay. And uh, we have people coming in with their comments about what they took away. So I'm losing the questions. Let's see. Can you remind me of the key adjustments needed in a chair? I'm sorry, the what re re the, re needed in a chair? The key adjustments. Oh, the key adjustments on, on typical ergonomic chairs. Yes. First of all, they should have a base of, of five legs. Um, that's sort of standard. Now, if you're using, obviously, uh, a, a uh, dining room chair or something, they're only going to have four legs. But typical ergonomic chairs have five legs. And then the general, general, minimal adjustments that you want, of course, is adjustment up and down. Um, generally tilt so that you can adjust, as Diane talks about that squatting position, you wouldn't want to have the chair tilted all the way back. And then something that adjusts for the, the backrest, whether it can go up and down. There are other adjustments that can be made, including the actual seat can go forward and back. But today's seats are made for a wide range of, of people. So those basics would be the up and down, the seat back, and then the tilt function. And Steve, I'd interject as well that you would want um, armrests that are either removable or at least can move up and down so that you can slide in underneath your desktop. Yeah, they usually get in the way. It's the first thing we usually recommend getting rid of um, in almost every single case that we review because they don't, they, at the end of the day, we generally see people slouching and it's because they're using their armrests or otherwise. But if you need the armrest to help you get up or you need the armrest for other reasons, you can leave them on. Good good point, Diane. And I'd like to say that the the lessons learned that are coming in are just various and across the board. So I think all okay. of your information was extremely useful and I will get that feedback to you guys so that you have a good understanding of where that um what people are are experiencing and also a lot of people are really appreciating the fact that you made us drop our our arms for 10 seconds that was a good exercise i think for a lot of people <laughs> great so well thank you deb and thank you diane Sure, that's our presentation today. So thank you everyone for attending today's webinar presented by Heffernan. Uh, this webinar has been recorded. A recording can be made available and we will send information by email with instructions on how to access a copy of the presentation on our website. So thank you very much, Steve Thompson and Diane Probert for your time and expertise today. We hope all of the, the attendees found today's webinar to be a valuable use of your time. And be sure to join us on February 2nd for training employees remotely. Thank you everyone and have a safe day.